Like snow in summer or rain in harvest, honor is not fitting for a fool. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse that does not come to rest. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the backs of fools. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Sending a message by the hand of a fool is like cutting off one's feet or drinking poison. Like the useless legs of one who is lame is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like trying a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. Like a torn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like an archer who wounds at random is one who hires a fool or any passerby. As a dog returns to its vomit, so fool repeats their folly. The sayings of Augustine of Jackie, an inspired uterus, this man's uterus to evil. I'm weary, God, but I can prevail. Surely, I'm only a brute, not a man. I do not have human understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I attained to the knowledge of the Holy One, who has gone up to heaven and come, back, and come down, whose hands have gathered up the wind, who has wrapped up the waters in a cloth, who has established all the ends of the earth. Why is his name? And what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Two things I ask of you, O Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and still and do dishonor the name of my God. I've not introduced myself. My name's Andrew. Um, I am the curate here. Uh, that is a trainee vicar but you do that for three years, and today is the end of my three years. So I think that means I can say whatever I like today and totally get away with it, um, but I'll be well behaved and uh, try and say uh, what the Bible has said. So let me pray, and then let's take a look at this passage together. Father God, we do thank you for your word to us, and we thank you for this book of Proverbs, which is unfamiliar to many of us um, and very different uh, from our culture and our approach and so we pray Lord that as we think about it again this morning you would make us wise would we be those who order our lives in this world in a way that accords with reality to the honor and glory of your name amen this doesn't have to be a rhetorical question but you also don't have to answer what does it feel like to be wrong? What does it feel like to be wrong? Rubbish. <laughs> Some humility being shown there from the back. Um, rubbish, yeah, and a few nods when, uh, when, when rubbish was said. Yeah, that, that sort of, that's kind of what it feels like. Well, I came across this question. Um, this guy who wrote this book, Jonathan Hates the Righteous Mind, uh, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Not a Christian, but he talks a lot about Christianity um, and, and self-righteousness in that book. Um, and he asked this question to a bunch of New York University students, and you'll be reassured, possibly, that they said the same thing as you. 
And he said, well, actually, no. We are wrong if we've answered that, and that's how I answered. What does it feel like not to be proved wrong, not to realize you're wrong? What does it feel like to be wrong? It feels exactly the same as being right. If you don't know you're wrong, you think you're right. Being wrong feels exactly the same as being right. It's only when we realize that we are wrong that we then have to decide what we're going to do with it. I came across a tweet uh, last week, week which said, when you are confronted with something that challenges your viewpoint, you have two options. One, admit you are wrong. Two, move heaven and earth to prove that you were right in the first place. And the sad thing is how few of us choose option one. We're, so few of us are ready to be challenged in our viewpoint. Why? Why? Well, I think one of the answers from the book of Proverbs would be pride. Our pride. We hate being shown to be wrong so much that we'll move heaven and earth to try and prove that we were right, even when we're challenged. As I said, this is my final week um, preaching from the book of Proverbs, my final week preaching here at St. Helens. And we're going to think about the most the most fundamental characteristic of the truly wise person from the book of Proverbs. Look back with me at uh, chapter 26. If you want, you can follow along. If not, don't worry, I'll read the verses that I'm referring to. But so that's on page 662, uh, chapter 26. And there is this, it's kind of like the antithesis, the opposite in every characteristic of the wise person. Throughout the book, you want to be wise, you don't want to be a fool and verses 1 to 11 uh, not so much a character assassination as a character exposure of the character of the fool honor verse 1 is not fitting for a fool we, we discussed this in the first week don't answer a fool according to his folly you don't want to get stuck in go down that descending kind of line of Facebook arguments and just be like the person you're arguing with but sometimes you need to push someone out of their folly and help them to see that they are wrong. And then we get these funny little ones about if you choose someone who is foolish to do a job for you, it'll come back on you. Sending a message by the hands of a fool is like cutting off one's feet or drinking poison. And we learn in this section, the fool isn't someone who knows nothing. The fool is someone who doesn't know how to use what they know. The fool doesn't know nothing they don't know how to use what they know. So verse 7, like the useless legs of one who is lame, is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. A couple of weeks ago we thought about that phrase, too many cooks spoil the broth, while on the other hand, many hands make light work. It takes wisdom to know whether we're cooking broth or whether we're doing work. Like tying a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. If honor, inappropriate honor, is given to someone who is foolish, then it's like tying the stone in the sling as you it'll come back and smack you in the head. But I deliberately asked Feruz to stop reading at verse 11, whereas this little bit finishes really in verse 12. After going through this section, we think surely there can be nothing worse than being a fool. Well, after this unrelentingly critical condemnation of the characteristics of the fool, this is what we read in verse 12. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes, there is more hope for a fool than for them. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for them. There is not a lot of hope for the fool, as we've been reading through Proverbs as we read those verses. But there's some hope. There's some hope for the fool that they might grow, that they might learn how to apply the knowledge that they have. And in fact, look again at verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, or... He will be wise in his own eyes. Even worse to be wise in his own eyes than being a fool. The fate you're looking to save them from is to be wise in their own eyes. What does it mean to be wise in our own eyes? And I'm not saying that I'm claiming to be wise. I'm not saying anyone here is claiming to be wise. But what does it, or that anyone's a fool, but what does it mean to be wise in your own eyes? What is this thing that by all accounts we want to avoid? What does it mean? To be wise in your own eyes is to think you know it all. 
To be wise in your own eyes is to roll your eyes when you are challenged by a new perspective. To be wise in your own eyes is to operate in a way that reveals whether consciously or much more dangerously, subconsciously, that we think we have nothing to learn from others. That is being wise in our own eyes. As we've gone through the book of Proverbs, we've seen wisdom is not a place that you arrive at. Wisdom is a posture. Wisdom is an attitude. Wisdom is being open to keep learning, a state of mind. As we've seen, the truly wise person will even welcome correction and rebuke because they know it will make them wiser. The proverb says, rebuke a fool and he will hate you for it. Rebuke a wise person and they will love you for it because they know it will make them wiser still. What is the most fundamental, most crucial characteristic of the person who is truly wise? It's humility. Humility is the fundamental characteristic of the wise person. Or as my lecturer at Bible College put it, humility is the meta skill of Proverbs. Humility is the meta skill of Proverbs, overarching the whole book. The only way we can get wiser is if we're open to learning. Here's a selection of the many, many verses across Proverbs that talk about humility. I'll read them probably too quickly for you to turn to them, so just listen up. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. 13.10, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice, who are humble. 18.12, before a downfall, the heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. Verse 22.4, humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. And 29.23, pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit, the humble, gain honor. It's not how our culture tends to think of wisdom, is it? The people that we put on, a, on pedestals as intelligent or wise or knowledgeable aren't normally humble people. I don't know who springs to mind if you think of wise people or if we ask the person in the street who they thought was wise, maybe a super smart celebrity like Stephen Fry or a philosopher like Elaine de Bottom or a scientist like Richard Dawkins, none of whom it is fair to say we would particularly describe as humble. The crucial, most fundamental characteristic of the truly wise person is humility. However, if you know Proverbs, the book of Proverbs for yourself, or you've been here the last few weeks and you've been listening and you're thinking now, you might be thinking, you're saying humility is the key to wisdom, but I thought the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. It says it in chapter 1, says it in chapter 3. And again and again throughout the book, commending the fear of the Lord. So which is it? Well, fear of the Lord, yes, is the beginning of wisdom. But turn, in fact, turn with me just a couple of pages back, if you're on page 26, to uh, chapter 22, verse 4. And the writer says this, that's page 6, 5, 8, 6, 5, 8, top left. Chapter 22, verse 4. Humility is the fear of of the Lord. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. You see, Proverbs is about wise living. Living in the world in a way that accords with reality. So we saw in our first week looking at this. In general, in life, those who work hard will be rewarded for it. And those who are lazy will suffer for it. In general, as we said, we know some people who work very hard and they fall on hard times, and we know others who are very lazy and win the lottery. But in general, in life, work harder, you'll be rewarded for it. Don't work hard, and you'll suffer for it. But the ultimate reality, the ultimate reality that we are supposed to live in line with, well, the ultimate reality, of course, is God. The ultimate one to whom we should listen is God. The ultimate one from whom we must learn is God. True wisdom is to put our confidence in God and to be humble to learn from God, acknowledging that as a creature, 
just a creature that I am, in the world that God has made, my knowledge will always be, can only ever be, limited, finite. And that explains the second reading. This is where we'll spend the rest of our time. Proverbs chapter 30, this slightly weird reading. The sayings of Agur, son of Jacke. When I was dictating that to my computer in the week, it said uh, the sayings of Arthur, son of Jackie. The sayings of Agur, son of Jacke, an inspired utterance. This man's utterance to Ithiel, I am weary God, but I can prevail. Verse 2, surely I am a brute. I'm an animal, not a man. I do not have understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I attained to the knowledge of the Holy One. Why put this slightly odd, almost like confession at the end of the book from Agur, whoever he happens to be? Agur knows his place. He knows that in himself he is not wise. He knows that he cannot attain to the knowledge that God has. He is humble. And so ironically, despite his lament that he has not gained wisdom, he proves himself to be wise. He has these four rhetorical questions in verse 4. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Whose hands have gathered up the wind? Who has wrapped up the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is the name of his son? Surely you know the answer to those questions is no one. Who has held the oceans in his hands? No one. And of course, passes me in every conceivable way. And who as my creator and redeemer has not only the qualifications, but also the right to tell me how to live my life. As Agur says in verse 5, every word of God is flawless. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or take away from his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. If we choose to disagree with God, it will not ultimately work in our favor. God will prove us to be wrong. And I think this is where the book comes together. This is how we see how we can be not, so in that posture of always learning, but not uncertain about what our life looks like, always learning, but yet confident and wise because we're confident in God and not in ourselves. We trust in God and not in ourselves. So what does it mean practically? As we, as I say, my last sermon in this series, I've got this mug. When I was at Bible college, they did this um, uh, communications course. That's how you should write a sermon. Um, so that, uh, there you go. If that doesn't make any sense, don't worry. It took them three days to explain it to us. But on the bottom of this mug, it says, what if this was your last sermon? What would you say? What if this was your last sermon? And their point being, each sermon could be your last sermon. What would you say? Every sermon is that important. But this is my last sermon with you guys. I know a few of you have said, come back and see us. I'd love to. The really difficult thing about going and working for another church is they're quite keen for me to be there on Sunday mornings. So it's difficult to come back and visit a church you used to be at. But St. Helens, this church, has been my church since September 2016. Five years. The time, that time has flown. I've been the curate here and a local resident at the end of Quinton Avenue since July 2018. You guys, St. Helens has become close to my heart. And now I have one last chance to speak to you. Now perhaps that does slightly affect, I've thought carefully about what I want to say, but this is not just a laundry list of things I want to say before I go, in kind of, and another thing. But as I've thought and reflected, there are three fundamental applications as we think about humility and wisdom from Proverbs that I think we can't avoid. Each will come up uh, briefly on the screen. And the first is, be humble, St. Helens. St. Helens, be humble. Trust in Christ's righteousness and not in your own. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. Be humble. Trust in Christ's righteousness, not in your own. Proverbs is about living in line with reality. And so it makes sense that the last word in wisdom is to fear God because the ultimate reality is God. And from Proverbs 3.34, this is how God feels, feels about the proud and the humble. 3.34, 
God mocks proud mockers, but he shows favor to the humble and oppressed. Jesus' friend, the apostle Peter, the one who denied him three times but then was restored by Jesus, quotes that verse in his letter in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. What is the ultimate expression of humility before God? It is to say, there's someone above me, someone who made me, someone who's greater than me, someone who is wiser and stronger and more knowledgeable, who surpasses me in every way, who is creator and holy judge, and who I have no right to approach standing in my own righteousness. Because like Agur, I know that I am often not wise. I'm often foolish, and I'm definitely not righteous. Agur asks those questions, who's gone up to heaven and come down, whose hands have gathered up the wind, the waters and a cloak, established the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Surely you know. Well, you may have come up with a very true answer to that. Is there anyone who's worthy, anyone who's truly wise, anyone for whom the answers to those questions would be yes? To Agur, the answer was, well, only God in heaven. But we know that the answer is also Jesus Christ who came down to earth. God in human form on the earth, perfectly worthy, perfectly wise, perfectly righteous, who didn't stay in heaven, but he came down to stand in our place, to take our place, to pay for our sin, to give us his righteousness. Peter again, chapter 3, verse 18 of his letter. For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous Jesus, for the unrighteous, us, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. As we saw in that picture of baptism, going down under the water, put to death in the body, but Jesus raised by the spirit bodily from death to walk again on the earth. And if we will trust Christ for ourselves, then we die with him. Our old, foolish, sinful self dies, and we rise with Christ's righteousness, with his wisdom. The ultimate humility is to say, yes, I know I need Christ. I know I am not worthy in myself. I know I am not wise in myself. I know I am not righteous in myself, and so I do not trust in myself. But for the day that I meet God, and each and every one of us will meet God one day, for that day I trust in Christ and his cross, in his death, in his resurrection. Be humble. Trust in Christ's righteousness and not our own. But secondly, be humble. Let God disagree with you. St. Helens, be humble. Let God disagree with you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's a famous verse, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. If you ever have ever at any point had or seen a Christian calendar, probably with pictures of sunsets and mountains and lakes, chances are you had this verse in there. Because it goes on and says, in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. And people think, ah, oh, this means that if I trust in God, my life will run smoothly and everything will be great. But let's not, and that's not what it means. That is not what it means. But let's hear the challenge in that verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That is difficult. The principal of my Bible college, Mike Ovey, now with the Lord. He used to ask us, will you let God disagree with you? Will you let God disagree with you? It's amazing how many of us, even sitting in the pews of churches week by week, who come to the bits in our Bibles that we don't like, and we choose just to pass over it, to not believe it. And then coincidentally, we create a God who somehow magically believes with everything that we think. Rather than acknowledging that we are made in God's image, we remake God in our image. You see, for all of us, as we read God's word, whatever culture we're from, 
However old or young, whatever our background or lifestyle, sooner or later we will find things in God's word that we disagree with, that we don't like, that challenge us. And in particular, as more time goes by, that society around us says are outdated or offensive. You may know, you may not know, this year ongoing, the Church of England is going through a project called Living in Love and Faith, where the church as a whole is having discussions, and you guys are going to be doing this sort of in an opt-in way in, in August, I think, talking about what do we think? What does the Church of England think about issues of human sexuality? The church has different views. Society has different views. I'm not going to tell you what I think right here. I'm not going to tell you even what the Bible says because anyone who's been here a little while knows that we've, we've preached that often and clearly. My challenge is this. As we are making those kinds of decisions, as we are thinking for ourselves, what do I think about this? As you, St. Helens, as others, as you are thinking about this as a church, on what basis will you make your decision? Will you make it on the basis of feelings? Will you make it on the basis of what society around us says? Or will we look at the Bible? Will we see what God has said? And if necessary, will we let God disagree with us? Will we be humble and let God disagree with us? Will we trust in the Lord with all our heart? Or will we lean on our own understanding? Will we be humble? Will we fear the Lord? Will we let God disagree with us? Allow ourselves to be challenged. If we are truly humble, if we truly fear the Lord, then we will accept that what Agur says is true. Every word of God is flawless. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. And we'll hear this warning. Do not add to his words. Do not call blessed. Do not call holy what the Lord has said is not holy. The prophets warn us. Do not add to God's words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Be humble, let God disagree with you. And lastly, and again, I know for some who are visiting for the first time, obviously you're welcome to come back and be a part of St. Helens. Or if you're further afield, you might want to look into possibly finding a church where you are. Or just consider these things for yourselves. But this one, particularly for the church families here at St. Helens, be humble. Remember that you need one another to be wise. Be humble. Remember that you need one another to be wise. Proverbs 9.9, 9, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. Wisdom is a group project. In order to receive instruction, we need to have an instructor. In order to be taught, we need a teacher. Proverbs 15.22, Pro plans fail for lack of counsel but with many advisors, they succeed. St. Helens, North Kensington, every church is called to be, has the potential to be, a light for Christ, a, like a, a, a city on a hill, shining out a light for Christ in the world. But it can only do that. It will only do that if it is a healthy church, if it is a bright light, living for Christ, shining for Christ. And one of the things that means is listening to one another. It also means listening to those who speak from the front. As I go, <laughs> keep listening to Steve. Listen to Steve. In Steve, St. Helens is blessed with a man who seeks to understand what Scripture says and then to say it to you. That is more unusual in the church than you probably realize. Many, many churches have pastors who would prefer to share their own views or to regurgitate the opinion columns from the broadsheets or the tabloids. Steve seeks to understand what God's word says and seeks to tell it to you. That is an immense blessing. Listen to him, pray for him, and appreciate him. But it also means listen to one another. One of the great joys of this last year has been as we've been more restricted in being able to meet than ever before, we've been meeting more than ever before and talking more than ever before through the life groups. 
Before the lockdown, we had about 10 people per week in the life groups. Now we've got about 30. Some on Zoom, some in person now as we go back. That's amazing. Don't lose that momentum. If you're in a life group, commit to that life group. Be there every week that you can. If you're not, make every effort. Is there one that you can make it along to? Tuesday at 11 a.m. or 7.30 p.m. Wednesday on Zoom, 7.15 p.m. If you really can't, then find someone else in the church where you do both have a diary slot that works and meet up and maybe read a psalm and pray together. Or grab one of those books from over there. And you can even have them for free if you want to do this. Read a book together and pray about it together. And as you do so, seeking to be humble, reminding one one another to trust Christ and let God disagree with you. Proverbs 15.33, as we close. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. Peter says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. Be wise. Be humble. Trust in Christ's righteousness, not your own. Let God disagree with you. And remember that you need one another to be wise. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have given us your scriptures. And we read in 2 Timothy, every word is breathed out by you and is able to make us wise for salvation and wise for this life. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, make us wise. May we know that to approach you in our own selves in our own righteousness would be foolishness. May we look to Christ and to his righteousness. Make us humble. Make us humble to allow you to disagree with us, to allow us to change our minds, to look to you and not us, and help us to be humble and remember that we need one another. And I pray as I go, I pray for this church, I pray for St. Helens, may this be a church of humility of wisdom, of love for Christ, of love for one another, and of love for its community. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.